Hello, I am Hannah Donner with the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Chandra is bringing you the latest environmental health science through our partnerships, calls, webinars, science serves, publications, and social media. I would like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, newest webinar in our series on COVID-19. Today's webinar is titled Pulmonary Health, Arts, COVID-19, and Air Pollution, Connecting the Science. Our moderator today is Karen Wang, Director of the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. We will leave time following the presentation for a brief Q&A session. You may type in questions to the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window at any point during the presentation. After the presentation, our moderator will read out questions for our speakers to respond to. We'll get to as many comments and questions as we can during the Q&A period. For those of you who called in on the phone, we have posted slides to accompany today's webinar on our website. You can download these by going to healthandenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and select today's webinar. On the webinar page is a link to the slides. Everyone on the webinar right now is muted with the exception of our moderator and our speakers. This webinar is scheduled to last for 70 minutes and is being recorded for our Calm webinar archive. With that, I'll turn things over to you, Karen. Great, thanks so much, Hannah. Welcome to this CHE webinar on pulmonary health, acute respiratory distress syndrome. COVID-19 and air pollution. Um, this is our fourth webinar on um, COVID-19 and environmental health. You can find the other recordings on our website. Today we will hear from three top scientists on the association between air pollution, ARDS, and the risk of mortality from COVID-19. Our first speaker today is Dr. John Balms. He is a professor of medicine at um, University of California, San Francisco, where he serves as an attending physician in the UCSF Division of Occupational and Environmental Medicine and the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. He is also a professor of environmental health sciences in the School of Public Health at UC Berkeley, where he directs the Northern California Center for Occupational and Environmental Health. He was appointed physician member of the California Air Resources Board in 20, 2008, where he still serves. Dr. Balms has been studying the effects of occupational and environmental agents on respiratory, cardiovascular, and met metabolic health for over 40 years. He has authored hundreds of papers and chapters, and his expertise in the health effects of ambient air pollutants has been recognized by multiple awards. Needless to say that we are thrilled he is here today. Our second speaker today is Dr. Jung Eun Ri. She's a postdoctoral fellow in the Occupational and Environmental Epidemiology Branch Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics at the National Cancer Institute. Her current research focuses on investigating cancer risks associated with environmental exposures such as air pollution, organic chemicals, and heavy metals, um, including research on cancer health disparities. Dr. Ree completed her PsyD in environmental health from um, Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. She will be presenting research on long-term exposures to PM 2.5 and ozone and risk of arts today. Our third and final speaker today is Xiao Wu, who is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Biostatistics at Harvard University. His research interests lie in developing causal inference methods to address methodological needs in the environmental health and public policy evaluation of health claims databases. During this webinar, Xiaowu will present one of the first preliminary investigations of the relationship between air pollution and COVID-19 related mortality in the United States. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Balms. Thank you so much. Thank you, Karen, and thank uh, Che for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I was supposed to talk about air pollution and respiratory health uh, and also set the stage for uh, Dr. Ri uh, and Dr. Wu uh, in 15 minutes. So it's a challenge, um, but I will try to talk a little bit about outdoor air pollution in terms of context, uh, set up air pollution and the acute respiratory distress syndrome that Dr. Ree will talk more about, and then uh, talk a little bit about the background for the work that Dr. Wu has done in terms of air pollution and COVID-19. So just to remind everybody that pollution, air pollution is the largest environmental cause of disease and premature death in the world today. 
this slide is from a Lancet uh, Commission report on pollution and health from a couple years ago. And you could see that pollution globally is actually more of a risk for uh, disease and disability and death um, than tobacco smoking. So that should be sobering. And just to remind everyone, especially uh, out here in California where I'm, Northern California where I'm speaking from, that there are natural sources of air pollution in terms of wildfires and volcanic eruptions, as well as the anthropogenic sources that we have more control over from both stationary and mobile sources. I will say, however, that many wildfires are really started by human activity. So air pollution has multiple sources. I've already said that. Here's a coal-fired power plant. We don't have these in California, but in the Midwest, South, uh, and East Coast of our country, we still have coal-fired power plants. Uh, pollution is always a mixture of gases and particulate matter. And traffic-related air pollution is one major component of this mixture. And certainly in California, it's our primary source of uh, pollution when we don't have wildfires, which we unfortunately have right now. There's a huge wildfire in wine country. Many of you have probably visited wine country, uh, Napa and Sonoma, and there's a devastating fire again in, in wine country. So I'm gonna only talk about two air pollutants because uh, I don't have time for more. I'm picking on the ones that cause the most uh, public health impacts. Ozone is a prototypic uh, oxidant pollutant. It causes chemical burns of the airways and deep lung. So just right off, if it causes chemical burning of the deep lung, that might predispose for acute respiratory distress syndrome, which involves inflammation and injury to the deep lung. And ozone, the major source is for motor vehicle emissions. Not directly, ozone doesn't come out of the tailpipes. It's cooked in the atmosphere. Uh, photochemistry during sunny afternoons. So rush hour emissions uh, lead to uh, exhaust from motor vehicles of uh, oxides of nitrogen and uh, volatile organic compounds and photochemistry causes uh, ozone. What do we know about ozone? A lot. It's actually the best studied of all the air pollutants because it, it was uh, one of the main bad actors in LA smog. Uh, which was the first uh, sort of pollution mix that caught uh, attention in, in California and in the US for that matter. So ozone causes respiratory symptoms, lower lung function and airway inflammation in healthy people. It can also lead to exacerbations of asthma and there's some evidence that it can cause new onset uh, asthma. And you know, here's a cartoon of a normal bronchial tube on the right and an inflamed bronchial tube of an asthmatic patient on the left. And ozone causes airway inflammation, which asthmatics already have. So you can imagine that ozone would increase risk for an exacerbation of asthma. And I don't have time to go into it, uh, but ozone is also associated with increased risk of uh, mortality, especially in, in people with pre older people with pre-existing heart and lung disease. The other pollutant I want to talk a little bit more about is ambient particulate matter, especially since uh, uh, both Dr. Rhee and Wu will talk about PM 2.5. Unlike ozone, which is a specific chemical compound, particulate matter is a mixture that includes particles of differing origin. And the combustion source particles from power plants or motor vehicles are the ones we worry about the most, but just dust from the Earth's surface, so-called crustal origin PM, or biological materials like uh, uh, pollen or fungal spores, endotoxin, can also have biological effect. And uh, particulate matter is regulated by particle size. Uh, and you can see with the cartoon on the right, this is a human hair, about 60 microns in diameter. And you can see uh, PM10, the yellow uh, spheres. So those are 10 microns in, in diameter. And then PM 2.5, 2.5 microns, and then these tiny ultrafine particles, which are 0.1 uh, micron and less. 
So ultra fines pretty much come from combustion. Uh, PM 2.5 mostly comes from com combustion. Uh, and then uh, PM 10 to 2.5, the so-called uh, uh, airway fraction uh, can come from multiple sources. So particularly matter health effects. Again, exacerbation of asthma, new onset asthma, decreased lung function growth in children. You know, we, our lungs grow from uh, birth uh, to early adulthood, then it's all downhill. And then much stronger evidence than for ozone uh, supports an, uh, an association between PM 2.5 and mortality. Again, in older folks with pre-existing heart and lung disease, especially ischemic heart disease. And there's also fairly strong evidence for an association between PM 2.5 and lung cancer and especially the diesel exhaust particle fraction of PM 2.5. So I'm moving on to uh, the uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome. I'm a pulmonary critical care doctor at uh, a public hospital in San Francisco. And I take, I've been taking care of people with ARDS for decades. It's a syndrome that um, causes people to be in intensive care units. It's often fatal. There's still about a 40% uh, mortality risk for all causes of ARDS. It involves fluid filling the alveoli or air sacs of the lung. And I think uh, Dr. Ree is going to show this same uh, cartoon. Uh, I'll let her go into it in more detail, but this is showing a hyperinflammatory response in the deep lung, uh, which causes leaky uh, capillaries. So fluid uh, leaks from the capillaries or blood vessels in the lung into the lumen of the lungs. And that makes it hard to breathe and decreases the oxygen tension in the blood. And there's a classic definition um, of ARDS. Uh, Dr. Rhea is gonna show you some chest x-rays that uh, show bilateral opacities. That's the fluid in the deep lung instead of air. And then respiratory failure, that's what causes people to be put on ventilators. Uh, and then uh, oxygenation is a problem. Even when we're giving 100% oxygen, uh, there may be a relatively low oxygen tension in the blood. And this is just uh, showing that people uh, who have to be on mechanical ventilation to maintain adequate oxygenation in their blood require intubation. Um, and we have to be very careful about how we uh, provide uh, ventilation through the ventilator uh, or we can further damage the lung from high pressure. And, you know, you need modern ventilators to do this properly. And that's part of the problem uh, when New York City got overwhelmed by COVID-19 uh, cases. COVID-19 can cause ARDS. Uh, Dr. Rhee will be talking about that. And uh, you need a lot of high-tech equipment and specialized care. And uh, ICUs in New York City were overloaded. That, was, that also occurred in Italy and Spain, for example. So uh, Dr. Rhee is going to talk about uh, a study that she did uh, with regard to air pollution and uh, ARDS. And I was proud to be a collaborator. I was the air pollution guy uh, on both of these studies, which were the first two studies published to show that there was a linkage between, ARD, between air pollution exposure and, and risk of ARDS. Uh, one, this was in Nashville, uh, where we showed a, a, an association between ozone and ARDS, especially in patients uh, who were, had ARDS because of trauma. Uh, ozone seemed to be a contributing risk factor and whether they were current smokers or not. And smoking causes airway inflammation, uh, just like I mentioned for asthma. So again, ozone and smoking were two uh, risk factors for airway inflammation, which is a feature of ARDS. And then in a, uh, a cohort in, in Philadelphia called the Penn Trauma Cohort, where we only studied uh, trauma patients at risk for ARDS, we showed that low to moderate uh, exposure to PM 2.5 was associated with uh, increased risk of ARDS. Dr. Rio will be talking more about that. I also wanted to set the stage for, for Dr. Wu. I'm really 
uh, pleased uh, that Dr. Wu is going to be speaking on his uh, seminal work with regard to PM 2.5 and risk of COVID-19 deaths. But there's a lot of reason to expect that uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus and COVID-19, uh, well, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, that infection can be uh, uh, the risk of both the infection and COVID-19 being sick from the virus uh, can be exacerbated by uh, exposure to air pollution. And we know from experimental studies in both humans and animals, so there have been human studies with influenza, rhinovirus, and uh, respiratory syncytial virus, a virus that mostly affects kids, that uh, air pollution can increase the uh, take of an infection and severity of infection. And some of the mechanisms by which, by which this may occur, impaired ciliary function, which is the first line of defense. So with the little hairs on our airway lining, which move particles up towards the mouth, get them away from the deep lung, can be impaired by air pollution. Air pollution, both ozone and PM 2.5 can cause chemical injury, oxidative stress uh, in the airways and deep lung. And then the macrophages, the macrophage means big eater. These are the amoeba-like cells and the alveoli that are the first line of defense against bacteria and virus in our deep lung. And then there are data about uh, influenza and uh, PM 2.5 exposure. Some of the best data come from China and there's a huge studies. And these two studies show um, an association between uh, exposure to PM 2.5 and flu-like illness on the left and uh, pneumonia, including uh, influenza on the right. And just for uh, a little bit of interest, the last big uh, flu pandemic that killed uh, millions of people in 1918, uh, there was a spike uh, in countries with high coal use versus low coal. So even back in the uh, 1918 flu pandemic, there was uh, some suggestion that air pollution from coal um, emissions uh, was playing a role in this and risk of the, of the viral infection. There's some evidence that suspended particles may spread the virus. There's some data from Italy and China in this regard. I don't have time to go into the details. It's not, I, I think, a robust association yet, but there's certainly concern about uh, aerosol transmission of the virus uh, and in particular air pollution particles may, the, the virus may uh, hitch a ride on these, these fine particles and make it down into the deep lung. And then uh, my last slide kind of trying to set the stage for uh, Dr. Wu is the original SARS epidemic. You know, this is SARS-CoV-2, um, SARS-1, if you will, uh, in China. Uh, case fatalities, deaths from uh, SARS-1 were associated with uh, air pollution index for PM 2.5 and a pretty linear relationship. So I hope I've uh, set the stage well for our next two speakers, Dr. Uh, Ri and Dr. Wu. I'm excited to hear what they have to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Balms, for your presentation and for helping us give some background on pulmonary health. Um, and ARDS in COVID-19. Uh, Dr. Ree will be pulling up her slides momentarily. Um, while she's doing that, I'd like to remind our audience to put in your questions in our Q&A feature on Zoom. Um, and when you're putting those in, we will be able to get to those at the end of the webinar, but you can put those any, in at any time during the webinar. And then we'll have our Q&A session at the end after the three presentations. All right, Dr. Ree, take it away. Dr. I think you might need to unmute. Is it good now? Yes, we can hear yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for joining today's webinar, everyone. Um, I would like to thank CHE to help me on this important topic and give me an opportunity to present my research. I would like to mention that this work is part of my um, PhD work at Harvard and presenting as a visiting scientist. Um, it's not related to my work at National Cancer Institute. 
I'll be briefly go over what ARDS is as uh, Dr. Bombs gave us a nice summary of what it is. I'm going into risk factors for ARDS and current scientific evidence of air pollution and ARDS and summary of current evidence. As Dr. Baums mentioned, um, a panel of experts in the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine developed the Berlin definition in 2011, and there are four characteristics to define ARDS, and uh, ARDS is respiratory failure not fully explained by heart failure or fluid overload. In the same figure you saw just a minute ago, um, compared to normal alveoli, alveoli of ARDS patients have this fluid built up you see my curse. Um, and this prevents oxygen getting into the bloodstream and organs to function. And another characteristic by chest image, um, bilateral opacity, I wanted to show this figure for your better understanding. Um, these four figures are radiological evolution of ARDS in 57 years old male. And the figure A shows uh, on the left, um, it's on admission and we don't really see pathological findings, but the next day we see some permanent consolidations that lung tissue is, is filled with fluid instead of air on a lower load. And the next two or three days we see rapid consolidations and um, you see this um, the white cloudy hazy image, so-called white lung appearance. And ARDS is diagnosed within one week of known clinical insert or worsening respiratory symptoms. And also by oxygen level, we can, ARDS can be also classified mild, moderate, and severe. The instance of ARDS ranges from 64 to 79 cases per 100,000 population year in the United States. And as you can see from this left figure, um, instance of ARDS increases with increasing ages. The average age of developing ARDS is around 62 years old, so older adults are at high risk of de developing ARDS. And as Dr. Baums mentioned, ARDS patients, most of ARDS patients require intensive care unit admissions and mechanical ventilations. Mortality rate ranges from 40 to 60%. ARDS develops in patients with underlying injuries such as sepsis or trauma as indirect lung injury or pneumonia and aspiration as direct lung injury. Sepsis remains the most common cause of ARDS occupies about 45%. And these clinical factors account for 85% of ARDS cases. And among 15% of other risk factors, there are two known environmental risk factors for ARDS, which is alcohol abuse and smoking. This review paper authored by Mosett 2014 nicely summarized um, the relationship between um, alcohol abuse, smoking, and ARDS risk. You can see from the left table, the subject with um, history of alcohol abuse had um, two to six times odds of developing ARDS compared to um, subject with no history of alcohol abuse. An active smoker has two to five two to five times odds of developing ARDS compared to non-smokers. And we see more evidence of air pollution as new environmental risk factors for ARDS. Uh, fine particles and ozones are associated with mobility and mortality due to different kinds of respiratory disease as Dr. Bonds introduced, such as asthma and COPD. And the Environmental Protection Agency has set national ambient air quality standards for short-term and long-term exposures for PM2.5 and ozone. And as you may be um, already familiar with these two studies published in 2017 in JAMA and New England Journal of Medicine, um, uh, authored by DL and Harvard Group, they found increased risk of all-cause mortality even below current standard for um, short-term PM2.5 ozone and um, annual standard for PM 2.5, which is 12 microgram per cubic meter. There is limited but actively growing um, evidence related to air pollution and ARDS. 
their most relevant five studies published so far and two studies, uh, including my study, Dr. Baum's co-authors. Um, there is one study found short-term exposure is associated with risk of ARDS and four studies looking at long-term exposure uh, to air pollution and associated with risk of ARDS and ARDS mortality. First study conducted in um, looking at short-term exposures conducted in Guangzhou, China, looking at air pollution associated with risk of ARDS. They conducted an ecological time series analysis for three years. They looked at daily emergency visit for ARDS and aggregate daily counts of emergency visit and examine daily concentrations of PM2.5, PM10, and PM1 and examine the effect of the same day air pollution with the emergency visit for ARDS and ARDS um, air pollution up to five days prior to emergency visit. They also looked at moving average of same day air pollution and previous one, three, five days air pollution in the model. They identified 17,000 em emergency visit for ARDS in this data as a main resource, they found 5% increased risk of ARDS for an interquartile range increase in one leg, one day leg, PM2.5, PM10, and 5% for PM2.5, and 4% for PM1. They found um, similar percent increase for same day air pollution and one leg day. Sorry about my air. <laughs> noise, uh, background noise. Um, this study conducted first, firstly in China, um, but as an ecological analysis, uh, they couldn't adjust for, for confounders, including ASIC smoking, other than the weather effect, including temperature and humidity and day outbreak. Second study published in 2017, Russia et al. Um, conducted a cross-sectional analysis of air pollution and risk of in-house room mortality among ARDS patients. They used uh, 2011 nationwide inpatient data, including 8 million hospital admissions, and used EPA county-level annual mean PM2.5 and annual daily maximum 8-hour ozone for the same year. And mainly they compare risk of in-hospital mortality among um, ARDS patients in highly ozone polluted cities defined by EPA, including Los Angeles, New York City, and Las Vegas versus the rest of the cities. Dr. V, I, yeah. I think your slides were not progressing a minute ago. Um, what okay. slide are you supposed to be on right now? Just want to make sure that we're caught up. It's progressing now. They're going ahead. Um, Sorry to interrupt. I see a slight number, but is it, um, I see right now the association between chronic exposure to air pollution and mortality in acute respiratory distress syndrome. Yeah, on the table too. Um, and the side says main results. Yes. Yes, I think we're on the right side now. It's advancing for some reason it wasn't before. Okay, you can continue. In this um, data, they identify 94,000 ARDS patients among 8 million hospital admissions. And among ARDS patients, 30% were treated in a hospital located in a high ozone pollution area. For main users, they found 13% increased odds of in-hospital mortality among ARDS patients treated in a hospital located in a high ozone area versus the control area. They also used continuous county level air pollution um, concentrations and then found significant association with um, in-hospital mortality among ARDS patients. Um, as a strength, they use um, nationwide data with large sample size, but it is a cross-sectional analysis using single year data. And they, uh, their e exposure assessment was pretty crude. Um, they assigned binary exposures for um, patients who treated in a high ozone versus non, like versus um, low ozone areas, and also they assign county level air pollution to individual analysis. Finally, our study um, published last year in CHEST, we used medical inpatient data for those uh, greater or equal to 65 years old. This data includes 60 million 
and our study period was for 12 years. We used ICNI same code to define ARDS um, for those diagnosed either primary or secondary. We identify about 1.2 million ARDS hospital admissions among 60 million um, Medicare populations. And we aggregate this annual counts of hospital admissions with ARDS per zip code. And in the analysis, we include about 37,000 zip codes. Uh, briefly, I'd like to talk about um, demographic information for ARDS patients in Medicare data. Um, the average age was about 78 years old. They tend to stay in a hospital about 14 days, seven days in intensive care unit. The sex ratio was pretty similar, a little bit more uh, for female. And majority was white as Medicare data predominantly include white, uh, about 85%. We um, utilize estimate uh, daily um, concentration of PM2.5 and ozone using previously validated prediction models um, developed by Dr. Joel Schwartz's group at Harvard. And we computed zip code level annual average concentrations for PM2.5 and ozone for um, the warm seasons from April to September. We conduct, um, as a statistical analysis, we conducted uh, put two pollutants generalized linear mixed model with a random intersect using zip code, assuming a Poisson distribution allowing for over dispersion. We adjusted for zip code level covariates, including A6 racial distribution, median household income, smoking, and weather effect as temperature and humidity in year. We also restricted area with low air pollution um, regions using current annual standard for PM2.5 and 45 ppb for ozone, which was um, 70 percentile of annual average ozone levels in our data. As main results, we found 0.7% increase in hospital admissions rates for ARDS per one microgram uh, per one microgram per cubic meter increase in annual average PM2.5 concentrations and 0.2% increase in hospital admissions rates for ARDS per one PPB increase in annual average ozone concentration. When we restricted area with low air pollution regions using um, current annual standards and 45 PPB for annual average ozone levels, the same annual increase in PM2.5 and ozone were associated with higher percent increase, uh, especially for the last, um, last group, we see almost twice um, percent increase compared to the main models. Most importantly, we found increased admissions rates um, below current national standards, um, similar to DLL 2017 for all-cause mortality paper. We conducted the largest study in this topic and first study investigating the older adults who are more susceptible to develop ARDS. And by um, using this estimated air pollution data, we could investigate areas um, not monitored by the EPA. And as this is also a ecologic study, we couldn't um, adjust it for individual comorbidity, um, but we could um, conducted some subgroup analysis I'd like to share if anyone is interested later. Um, as all other ecological uh, environment <laughs> epidemiologic studies, uh, we cannot rule out unmeasured confounders. But in a sensitivity analysis, we conducted some propensity score models. And the direction of associations was similar for our main analysis. We also use ICG-9 sample to define ARDS rather than um, Berlin definition. It's a summary of current evidence. Um, there are more studies have shown that long-term exposure to air pollution are associated with increased risk of ARDS rather than short-term. And in our study, um, we showed that increased admissions rates for ARDS associated with long-term exposure to PM2.5, um, even below current national standard. 
uh, with the limitation of conducting ecologic study, I think it's important to um, repeat this analysis in an individual analysis, um, adjusting for important confounders for both short-term and long-term exposure to air pollution associate with risk of RDS and RDS mortality. Uh, during this talk, I didn't really mention, but um, there are evidence that in a low um, neighborhood SES shown higher air pollution levels and also their higher air distance incidence among African American. So I think it's important to replicate this study in racially, ethically diverse populations as we couldn't really look at in using Medicare data um, include predominantly white. And as Dr. Ba mentioned that um, RDS develops in a predisposing condition such as sepsis and pneumonia, I think it's really interesting to look at mediation analysis, how this air pollution um, is associated with comorbidity and further develop RDS. I would like to acknowledge um, Dr. David Christiani today, unfortunately he couldn't join, but he is a senior author of our paper and my PhD mentors, uh, Dr. Francesca Dominic and Antonella Giannavetti. Uh, Dr. Bams uh, is also co-author of my paper, Dr. Schwartz, Wang Di, and we also like to um, acknowledge funding support from NIHS, EPA, and the Health Effect Institute. If you have any detailed questions, please reach out to me um, using this email. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Reeve. This is important information and research that you've presented today. Um, while we're waiting for uh, Dr. or for Mr. Wu to pull up his slides, um, I would just remind everyone we see some good questions coming in, but remind you to continue sending those questions in and we'll get to them after our final presentation. Dr. Wu, or Mr. Wu, would you like to take it away? Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure to uh, present uh, our recent work uh, that's to link the air pollution and the COVID-19 mortality in the United States. This is a preliminary work uh, that's uh, come out uh, just a month ago. And uh, as the background information, COVID-19 pandemic is an unmatched public health emergency, and uh, it's very important to identify key environmental factors. Oh, sorry. Important to identify key environmental factors such as air pollution that may contribute to the severity of health among individuals with COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Because uh, why it's important? Because it can guide the policy and behaviors to minimize uh, the fatality related to the pandemic. And it's provide a strong scientific arguments towards the revision of the US national PM 2.5 standard in the pandemic. As I just said, Mr. this Mr. is the- Sorry to interrupt, um, we can't see your slides. Do you oh, want to okay. try pulling them up oh. again? And if not, I can share. Can you see, uh, see the slide? Yes, now, perfect. Okay, so uh, as I just mentioned, uh, we are not seeking for a conclusive stu studies until now, but we hope to stimulate discussion in this rapidly evolving area of research. So uh, as uh, Professor uh, Baums um, has already mentioned, um, that's uh, there are a lot of evidence uh, uh, around uh, the acute respiratory distress syndromes, ARDS. And uh, the previous publications already see that COVID-19 actually can cause uh, both ARDS and uh, viral pneumonias, which has a really high mortality rate. And COVID-19 can cause severe inflammations to the heart and circulatory systems, which uh, could uh, create adverse health outcomes of um, uh, human beings. And uh, the demographics among the uh, COVID-19 uh, 
patients uh, is uh, a majority uh, the older population, older people. And there are certain comorbidities that need to uh, increase in mortality among COVID-19 patients, especially hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular uh, diseases, uh, cerebrovascular diseases, those are all uh, potential health effects of COVID-19. And on the air pollution side, there are established uh, evidence uh, about the health effects of long-term exposure to PM2.5, uh, including uh, the, long uh, the associations between long-term exposure to PM2.5 and heart and lung disease, brain disease, uh, and uh, aggravated asthma, and decreased lung functions. Uh, the potential pathway is uh, PM2.5 as a type of uh, uh, very highly particulate matters that actually can enter our respiratory systems through the nose and throat. And because it's so tiny, people cannot uh, coughing them or sneezing them out. So they can penetrate deep into the lung and cause a lot of uh, uh, health uh, problems uh, uh, for human bodies. So that's uh, established evidence. And the, in the previous epidemiological evidence, uh, uh, as uh, the first two uh, presenters already uh, uh, mentioned, uh, a lot of uh, uh, literatures about the associations of uh, long-term PM2.5 and uh, different uh, type of diseases outcomes here. Uh, there, uh, we, uh, our group has conducted the uh, largest uh, uh, ever studies that's to associate it with long-term PM2.5 exposure and all cost mortalities using uh, the entire medical cohort across uh, 16 years. So this is the largest study ever that we find um, uh, we use a sophisticated statistical method, including some uh, newly developed uh, method that uh, could uh, potentially uh, increase uh, the likelihood of a causality, some causal inference method. We find that uh, there are potentially uh, one uh, more than 100,000 lives could be saved in one, one decade if we lower the air quality standards uh, to 10 microgram uh, per cubic meters. Uh, the current standard is 12, so lower to a unit. And why in these studies we want to investigate effects of PM2.5 are COVID-19 death mortality? Because uh, we find also the epidemic of COVID-19 is evolving. We find actually, uh, as I just uh, mentioned in the previous slides, there's a large overlap between the cause of death of COVID-19 patients and the disease that's af affected by the long-term exposure to fine particle matters. So we hypothesize that because long-term exposure to PM2.5 affects the respiratory and the cardiovascular systems, it can also increase the severity of COVID-19 symptoms and may increase the deaths as the worst uh, case. And uh, we conduct one of the first preliminary investigation of uh, this question in the United States. And here is a map among the average long -term, uh, county level long-term average uh, PM2.5 concentrations uh, across the 17 years in the United States. And the right figure is the county level uh, number of COVID-19 deaths per 1 million population in the United States up to June 18th, uh, where uh, the analysis conducted uh, in our paper. And in order, uh, because actually this is a statistical analysis, observational, uh, using observational data, we need to account for potential confounders uh, to make sure our association is uh, truly exists. For example, different counties, if they have a different population density, 
or they have a different level of uh, 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 hospital uh, resources or different temperature humanity and the timing of issue issuance of a public policy intervention or uh, the timing of the epidemic curves or the uh, mobility measures or longitude and latitude. These are potential confounders uh, that could distort the associations between our outcome COVID-19 deaths and the exposure, which is a long-term exposure uh, to point, PM 2.5. So we adjust uh, those potential confounders in our model uh, in order to uh, uh, try our best uh, to assess uh, the true association between them. And here is the main result. So on June 18th, we find that that's an increase of one microgram per cubic meters in PM 2.5 is associated with 11, and a percentage increase in the county level COVID-19 mortality rate. And the association is very consistent through the time periods. As uh, you can see, that's we run the analysis uh, from the middle of April to uh, September 17th. And uh, you can see that the association always report 8% uh, to about 12% uh, increase in the county level COVID-19 mortalities. So the result is uh, consistent throughout time as more and more COVID-19 patient data come into our analysis. And they are also very robust to different level of uh, sensitivity analysis. And uh, another uh, important findings in our, uh, in our uh, statistical analysis is that we find almost 50% of increase of community mortality rate associated with the one standard that deviation increase in the percentage uh, black residents of those counties because uh, uh, among uh, more than 3,000 US uh, counties, uh, each county have a different uh, percentage of uh, black residents. And we find that, uh, that as uh, the county have uh, uh, increased uh, more percentage of black residents, actually we find that that's, uh, uh, the uh, COVID-19 mortality uh, rate is higher in those counties, which actually match uh, the result that's from the CDC. And as I have uh, mentioned uh, in our statistical models, this is uh, ecological regression because we want to uh, associate the county level uh, COVID-19 mortality to the county level PM 2.5. So we don't know the individual level data, but this definitely have some uh, strengths for our analysis uh, because the data is represented for the entire US populations. And those are the only data sets that can be accessed uh, by the public in a timely fashion only several months uh, since uh, the first case arriving in the United States. And it's allowed the inference uh, in the area levels, which is used for, for the policy making. And it could facilitate the comparison of results across uh, countries. For example, I am aware that similar study have been published uh, using the data from Italy and find a very consistent result. And uh, we can actually uh, conduct uh, the study uh, day by day, every day, as more data come in. So it uh, uh, provide a dynamic uh, trend of our data. But definitely there are some limitations. For example, we, we don't have uh, access to the individual level patient data. So uh, this could lead to ecological fallacy, which means that you can, uh, uh, researchers cannot explain these results on the individual level. Uh, so further studies uh, definitely need to be conducted at uh, this direction. And we cannot adjust for individual risk because we don't know uh, for each patient uh, what's their age, uh, what's their gender, uh, what's their race. We only know the race, gender, or age distributions for those particular county. 
So also uh, the, uh, there may be sensitivity uh, sensitive to the assumption of the statistical models. Uh, and the other challenge involving, for example, at this stage, we know that there are potentially outcome uh, classifications. Uh, for example, some patients uh, who uh, have COVID-19, but uh, didn't uh, include in the data sets uh, 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 into the record, or there is uh, a mismeasure uh, in the exposure, uh, especially for the largest counties, uh, for example, uh, Los Angeles counties, uh, that uh, is very, very large and uh, have uh, millions of residents, and the different residents may actually expose different level of uh, uh, PM 2.5 throughout their time, uh, but uh, we can only assign a one, one value, which may cause uh, the uh, mismeasured uh, exposure. And there are confounding factors uh, that could lead to uh, different, uh, leads to uh, uh, sensitivity or uh, sensitive of our results. For example, uh, there are among our major confoundings uh, that may cause the bias of our result. And so this needs to uh, think about uh, what will be the future direction for our research. For example, we can augment it some individual COVID-19 data that's right now uh, starting to, uh, to be collected uh, at the by hospital systems or um, some uh, health, uh, uh, governmental health departments. We can uh, borrow those individual level patients to augment the county level data to correct for ecological bias. We can also uh, conduct individual studies on the air pollution and the important fatal COVID-19 outcome, for example, ARDS, uh, using both the traditional regression method or the causal inference method. That's uh, applicable uh, future research direction. In terms of the individual studies on the air pollution and the COVID-19 patients, it might be uh, uh, a little bit more challenging involved because access to those individual net level data require consideration for many privacy, legal, and ethical trade-offs, which may require actually mount an emergency response team to gather quality COVID-19 data because I, 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 I I'm not aware of any teams uh, that uh, get, could get a representative uh, high quality COVID-19 data could be used for the uh, environmental studies of the air pollution and COVID-19. Also, uh, a very interesting question is whether the short-term air pollution and the COVID-19 uh, and the important effect of comorbidities, uh, for example, whether the uh, wildfire smoke may increase the risk of COVID-19. That's a really interesting future research direction. As uh, I just mentioned, there are definitely public health implications uh, from our studies. For example, we want to prioritize counties uh, that are historically are more pollutant. Uh, otherwise, uh, this will uh, create uh, health burdens uh, from the uh, severe COVID-19 outcomes for those counties. And it's very important to stress the importance of continued regulation of PM2.5 and other air pollutants because this uh, historical uh, high heavy pollu uh, pollution actually creates a really huge health abundance uh, at stake. We cannot change the historical air pollution levels anymore, but uh, we can for sure to uh, actually uh, regulate uh, uh, the air, uh, to air pollution and to make uh, a clean air in the future. And we find in our study that the people of color and the poor people are disproportionately affected by both air pollutions and the COVID-19 pandemics. This uh, increased uh, uh, exacerbation the uh, health uh, disparities, which is a very important uh, health, um, uh, public health uh, issues. 
And uh, this is the website uh, of uh, our uh, studies. And uh, I would like to thank you uh, to our teams. Uh, this is definitely a teamwork. And in order to make our study reproducible, uh, we include all the code and the data uh, publicly available on the GitHub. And uh, here is uh, the GitHub link and the website. And uh, thank you for your listening and any feedback and questions are welcome. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, please type in your questions into the Q&A box. Um, uh, Dr. Bombs um, has a hard stop at 11, so I'm gonna ask questions um, to him first. Um, we had a couple of questions um, about, understandably, smoke and wildfire incidents like we are currently seeing. Um, is there any evidence that high exposure events produce a spike in ARDS or other outcomes, including premature death? And can you talk about what you think might be the impact of recent fires on increased risk of COVID-19 illnesses this fall and winter? Yes, and I see two of my <coughs> friends and colleagues from California ask some of those questions, uh, Paul English and Mike Wilson um, from the California Department of Public Health. Well, I've been on the media uh, all over the Bay Area saying that I'm worried about the nexus between the COVID pandemic and wildfire smoke. You know, based on the data that uh, both Dr. Ree and Mr. Wu uh, just showed us, uh, and the information that I also mentioned, we worry that these high exposures to wildfire smoke will increase the risk of uh, both SARS-CoV-2 infection and then COVID-19, which is symptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, we don't have any hard evidence yet because this wildfire season is still happening. Uh, we have a lot of evidence from uh, other studies of wildfire smoke prior to the COVID pandemic that suggest strongly that lower respiratory tract illness in general, uh, the risk is increased with these uh, really poor air quality episodes from wildfire smoke. We just, uh, you know, we just don't uh, have hard evidence with regard to wildfire smoke, but I'm very concerned about it. And can you speak a little bit um, to, you know, air pollution specifically to children and pregnant women? And what are, are there special health effects um, for children and for, for other highly sensitive groups? Yes. Uh, for PM 2.5 in general and wildfire smoke PM 2.5 specifically, um, there are especially vulnerable groups. And so those groups, when the AQI, the air quality index turns to yellow, should be uh, careful, um, even if the rest of us are not particularly bothered. And that's people with pre existing heart and lung disease, most commonly asthma, uh, uh, older folks over 65 who don't have diagnosed heart and lung disease. Uh, very young children and uh, pregnant women who are bearing the youngest children. Uh, we know that in utero exposures to a variety of in environmental agents, including air pollution and specifically PM 2.5 can have adverse birth effects. Uh, and actually we, we have a little data for wildfire smoke. There was one study, for example, from uh, uh, Southern California from San Diego from years ago when we, it wasn't even as bad as it currently is now in terms of air quality that showed low birth weight, for example, in association with wildfire smoke. So yes, uh, all of those groups should be careful about uh, exposure to wildfire smoke. Okay, you mentioned um, in your slides that over 7 million deaths per year from air pollution. Do you know if m most of those deaths are in developing countries and do we have any estimates of how many deaths in the United States can be attributed to air pollution? There still uh, are deaths in the US that can be attributed to air pollution, specifically PM 2.5. But the uh, importance of PM 2.5 as a risk factor is greater in a heavily polluted country like India or China. Um, so there's a disproportionate burden of PM 2.5 uh, mortality in those countries. And, uh, you know, that's why we need to be helping those countries uh, move towards cleaner economies. Uh, you know, there's also a climate change reason, uh, but we really need to be 
uh, supporting a country like India, which is rapidly developing, uh, needs more electricity to move away from coal. But it doesn't help to just say, get rid of coal. We have to figure out a way to help India move to, away from coal. Uh, and that's going to take resources from uh, the developed world to a country like India. But it's, it's not just India. I'm singling India out only because it's particularly populous and there's particularly bad air pollution. Great. Thank you so much. I know that you have a hard stop now. Um, there was a question about, um, I think Dr. Ree can answer it. Are there, are you aware of any studies linking um, PM pollutant exposure to leukemia? Um, so in 2013, IR classified outdoor air pollution, including particulate matters as group one carcinogens, uh, but predominantly on uh, epidemiologic evidence of associations with lung cancer risk. Uh, there is some evidence with breast cancer, leukemia, and lymphoma, but it's quite limited. Although um, some traffic-related air pollution, um, such as residential proximity to the main roads or industry sites have been related to increased risk of uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Okay, great. Um, we had some questions for you, Xiaowu. Um, some occupational groups are highly exposed to PM 2.5 from diesel exhaust emissions and smoke, for example. Do you think your findings could be applied to health effects among workers in these groups? Yeah, um, I think, uh, firstly, uh, as I, I have uh, mentioned, uh, so because uh, our studies uh, is uh, county level studies, which uh, in theory uh, cannot be applied to any uh, individual uh, uh, health effects uh, uh, scenarios. So, but uh, in the previous uh, analysis uh, about uh, the PM 2.5 to add uh, to all cause mortality or other uh, disease burdens, uh, those studies are actually using the individual level data and we also find uh, positive uh, associations of PM 2.5 and uh, a lot of uh, different uh, type of uh, uh, cardiovascular diseases or the respiratory diseases. So I think those study findings are for sure can apply to, uh, the, to the to the to uh, the occupation uh, the specific occupational group uh, the health founders for those health uh, uh, occupational uh, working groups. So, uh, but for the COVID-19 specifically, I think uh, uh, definitely an individual level studies uh, is needed uh, to see whether uh, they are more prone to uh, sever uh, the COVID-19 uh, infection or uh, have a severe COVID-19 outcomes among those group. Okay, thank you. Um, have either of you um, looked or know about the literature on PM 2.5 particle source characteristics to see if there are any specific sources um, that are worse in terms of uh, materials, chemicals. Um, for existence, for example, is diesel PM 2.5 uh, different or worse than incinerator 2.5, et cetera? Um, I, I can briefly talk about it. So. The China study I uh, introduced for the short-term air pollution, they actually looked at PM2.5 components. Um, it, they found um, organic carbon, sulfate, and ammonium are um, associated with increased risk of ARDS. Uh, but it's quite limited, and I think there are many other studies looking at PM components, looking at different outcomes, such as um, other respiratory disease or cardiovascular disease. But in ARDS field, um, it's quite limited. I think it's very important to look at it. Um, another study we conducted looking at, um, as they mentioned, the living in certain industrial sites, we also looked at um, living in an area with high number of manufacturing industry or um, construction industries, and we found um, 
significant associations with increased uh, risk of hospital admissions. So this is a surrogate and it's not, uh, we can't tell exactly what source would be the bad actor, but yeah, I think it's definitely important to look at um, the extracted metals or the source of PM2.5, which is most significant um, risk factor for ARDS. Great. Is there, do you know of any evidence um, on diet or nutrition um, influences on risk and severity of ARDS, either of you? I'm not quite familiar okay. <laughs> with the diet effect. Um, shall we do now? <laughs> For the nutrition, no, as, <laughs> sorry. Okay, that's fine. Um, uh, Dr. Ri, um, do ARDS and COVID patients differ from ARDS and patients from other causes that you know of? Um, I wish Dr. Bones is here no, to answer that question. Um, yeah, I'm not quite the severity of ARDS, I guess um, the audience is asking. Um, yeah, I, I don't think I'm the best person to answer that, but with a, from a conversation with um, Dr. Krishani, it, like all the physicians, I think, are surprised to see um, how COVID patients often they, um, develop ARDS, and it's it's really predominant. And um, yeah, I think it's, <laughs> but I'm not quite sure um, compared to other comorbidities. Um, Shall we had a couple of um, questions about you know, whether or not you can separate long-term pollution effects from uh, the pollution levels around the time of illness and death. And, you know, how did you decide on the time lag between um, air pollution and COVID-19 in your, in your study? Yeah, uh, I think this is actually a very good question. So here uh, we are uh, specifically to uh, look at the long-term uh, so the long term here is uh, defined uh, uh, 70 years long term average, uh, long -term average uh, from 2000 to 2016. We did some sensitivity analysis, uh, for example, using a shorter uh, uh, time period, uh, let's say uh, 2016 alone, uh, just a one year. Uh, we find that the result actually is very similar. Uh, actually, uh, the reason is that uh, across uh, uh, the time, uh, the time periods, uh, actually uh, in the uh, past 20 years, actually the county with the rank of a county with heavier pollutants or lighter pollutants actually unchanged uh, uh, throughout the uh, uh, past uh, uh, 10 years, 20 years. So if we just uh, do a county level comparisons, actually the long term uh, uh, effects is quite consistent, uh, no matter we use uh, the past 20 years of data, average of 20 past, uh, uh, past 20 years, or I mean just use uh, uh, one years of the data. Uh, for the short term, actually the short term and long term in most air pollution study is uh, uh, more like the short term uh, is uh, the daily uh, or and uh, more uh, shorter than hourly. Uh, exposures uh, within the, COVID, uh, uh, the the study period. So this uh, in these studies uh, we haven't uh, studied that uh, yet because that's often re uh, required uh, individual level patients. But in the previous uh, studies uh, that's using the Medicare populations uh, that we uh, we uh, studied. Uh, uh, the air pollution effects on the all cause mortalities among the entire Medicare populations. Actually, our group has studied both uh, the long term and the short term uh, uh, effects. And the, uh, the study finding is that actually the long term effects uh, is uh, much larger than the short term effects, but the both are positive uh, uh, create the adverse health effects of the uh, health boundaries uh, or next day, or, or cause mortalities of uh, uh, medical population. Great, there was one. Sorry, oh. I, I would like to just um, add um, some comments on the question. 
uh, so when we first um, thought about like long-term versus short-term exposures to air pollution related to air death risk, uh, as we um, saw very beginning the Berlin definitions of air death, the physicians diagnose so RDS patients come with other predisposing conditions and when they admitted to the hospital, physicians diagnosed them uh, whether they have RDS or not within one week of um, admissions. And so although there was one study in China looking at same day air pollution um, for emergency visit for RDS, I think looking at same day air pollution or even up to um, one week prior to emergency visit or air, Automations, um, those patients may already be under um, mechanical ventilations, then it, they must be have like filtered air already. So I think it's kind of hard to sh see in the short term um, effects of air pollution on ARDS risk because um, it's not the same as normal people um, opening the window and we see similar um, outdoor and indoor air pollution. Okay, great. Um, one last question for you, Xiao. Um, can you speculate on the direction of the ecological bias? Uh, there was. Okay, yeah. So the ecological bias uh, actually uh, refers uh, to that if uh, you are using uh, aggregate level quantities uh, to analyze uh, the correlations, uh, for example, here we use the county level PM2.5 and the county level uh, mortality of uh, uh, COVID-19. Uh, this uh, association may be not a equal to the correlations of the individual quantities. So uh, what, uh, what could be the next step? The next step is that we collect uh, some data, uh, but uh, under uh, this such a short uh, time period, those data are very likely only represent uh, for a small uh, geograph uh, geographic regions, uh, for example, um, certain states uh, that could make uh, the individual level data access to uh, public health researchers, uh, but other states may not. So we need uh, to use uh, a statistical method to correct uh, the associations on the uh, uh, on the uh, county level on the aggregate levels using that uh, subset of uh, the individual level data. That's our uh, ongoing uh, project uh, uh, about the COVID-19 uh, data. But uh, this is still not idea. The idea case is uh, definitely that we can have uh, a representative uh, samples of the individual level health record uh, for the COVID-19 patients in the United States. But this definitely uh, needs uh, a larger uh, uh, consortium or a larger uh, uh, school-wide uh, school or I mean, uh, universities-wide uh, or um, or I mean the collaborations with uh, governmental health departments uh, in order to have uh, this data being accessed and analyzed. So that's it's a two 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 step uh, one to use a small amount of individual level data, but finally we want to analyze on uh, uh, entire uh, COVID nineteen uh, cohort uh, that could answer, provide the most uh, comprehensive pictures of the association between the air pollution, environmental factors, and the COVID-19 uh, outcome. Okay, great. Thank you. We um, are out of time. Um, we had a, uh, one question about indoor air quality versus outdoor air quality and filtration. Um, che is actually putting together right now um, a webinar on COVID-19 and indoor air quality and filtration. Um, so uh, please sign up for our newsletter so that you can um, get news of when that uh, webinar will be. Um, so Hannah, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Karen. Yeah, actually that webinar on indoor air quality and COVID will be on December 9th or 10th um, at 2 p.m. Oh, Eastern time. Um, so it's on the calendar. Details to come on our website soon. Um, thank you so much to Karen and our speakers. We're approaching the end of today's webinar.
A video recording will be available on Che's website soon, and tomorrow you'll receive an email containing a link to the video. The next Che Alaska Partnership call will take place tomorrow, September 30th, and is titled The Proposed Pebble Mine and Threats to Our Ways of Life, Bristol Bay Community's Ongoing Efforts to Protect Our Cultures and Health. To learn more and to RSVP, please visit our website at healthandenvironment.org. We will also be hosting another webinar, the one that Karen was mentioning in our ongoing COVID-19 series in November 10th, um, so it's November 10th, on indoor air quality in schools and daycare facilities. Details will be posted on our website soon. To learn more on RSVP, please visit our website at healthandenvironment.org. If you are new to CHE and would like to stay updated about upcoming events or more, please sign up to receive our newsletter by selecting the Join Us tab at the top of any page on our website at healthandenvironment.org. Additionally, if you appreciate these CHE partnership webinars bringing you the latest environmental health research for free, we encourage you to, we encourage you to support CHE's ongoing work by making a tax-deductible donation via our secure website. Again, our website is healthandenvironment.org. With that, I would like to thank our speakers, Dr. Balms, who's no longer with us, but Dr. Rhee and Dr. Wu, all three of them. Um, thank you so much for presenting your research and to Karen for your excellent moderation. Thank you so much for joining us. Stay well and healthy and have a good day. <laughs>